Hey everyone, it's James, also known as Flagman, and welcome to my retrospective of the 2023 fresh season of Splatoon 3. If you're interested in reliving some of your springtime memories in Splatoon 3, keep watching. This video is going to be a recap about everything, and I mean everything, that happened from 1st March to 31st May 2023, and my overall opinions on the season as it happened. Let me just inform my viewers who live in the Southern Hemisphere, such as Latin America, Southern Africa, and Oceania. And if you're wondering why the season was a springtime season, well, in the Northern Hemisphere, which was my home in Canada, and Nintendo's home in Japan, your autumn is our spring. And don't even ask me why Americans call autumn fall, that's a question I cannot answer. If you enjoy content like this, please drop a like and also subscribe and turn your notifications on to see more cool content like this. So I hope you enjoy it. Anyways, let's get into the retrospective. The fresh season began on March 31st, 2023, and with it also came the first wave of the Splatoon 3 expansion pass. We got to travel to Ingopolis. As a person who never played the first Splatoon game, this is a big deal because the Wii U only sold 12 million units. The Switch sold 10 times that number. Additionally, many Splatoon players got their start in Splatoon 2, since Splatoon 1 came out around the end of the Wii U's short lifetime. Also, getting to see Othwings in Ingopolis Plaza is finally a dream many of us wish came true. Nintendo sure answered our prayers. We have two new, excuse me, three new shop owners and two returning ones. The returning ones are Annie and Jolonzo. You may recognize Annie from being the operator of Splathead Shop on your Nintendo Switch, but for those wondering about Jelonzo, he's actually the father of Jelfonzo, the shop owner of Closed Store in Splatoon 2. As for Shelly and Nani, according to Nintendo, they were once shown as apprentices, but I predict that maybe they're his children. Fred Crumbs is the new shoe store owner in Ecopolis, and let me say, this is the first time I've seen Tempura with an earring. Specifically, he's a Tempura Japanese Jack Mackerel. In addition, we also have buildings for Salmon Run, a table for Battle Dojo was added to an alley, Spike is back, and I noticed that some things from the first Splatoon game have been replaced, such as the Battle Dojo being replaced with the Shoal, the Arcade Machine being replaced with a Hot Lanthus Terminal, and most obviously, knowing Goblin's news. We now just tune into Anarchy's Blackcast, which would make sense, as the Squid Sisters have retired from stage announcements, and I don't know what's been up with Off the Hook. So much for Marina calling in Coppola's Plaza a ghost town during the Retro vs. Modern Splatfest. Additionally, this new catalog introduced an emote referencing the wind emotes from the first Splatoon game, and at the same time we got... this. Why does this emote look like my inkling is humpy? Man, you sure know how to get jump past the sensors, Nintendo. But let's be honest, that's not really why the Goblin DLC exists, is it? No. It's because we gotta see the Squid Sisters performing Splatfests again, isn't it? Well, you got that right. The real and often only reason this DLC exists is because the 3DS and Wii U eShops closed it on February 27, 2023. Nobody will be able to swipe Splatoon digitally now because of that, and physical copies for Splatoon 1 will go on sale like wild on eBay. The Goblin's DLC will be the closest we can get to reliving the early days of Splatoon, or the golden days of Splatoon if you're a veteran, and I noticed that some of the weapons introduced during the season, such as the 96 Gal Deco, were direct references to Splatoon 1. We even got Kraken Royale introduced as a special weapon, which is literally a more balanced version of the Kraken for Splatoon 1. We also got another special weapon, this being the Super Chum. Included in the kits of two weapons, including NZAP 89, which is my signature and favorite weapon in Splatoon 3. We also got ourselves 12 new weapon kits added, with those being the Crack on Splat Roller with Squid Beacon and Crack and Royale, the 96 Scout Deco with Splash Wall and Crack and Royale, the NZAP 89 with Auto Bomb and Super Chump, the Clash Blaster Neo with Curling Bomb and Super Chump, the Z plus F Splat Charger with Splash Wall and Triple Ink Strike, the Z plus F Splatter Scope with Splash Wall and Triple Ink Strike, the L3 Nozzle Nose D with Burst Bomb and Ultra Stamp, the Rapid Blaster Deco with Torpedo and Ink Jet, the Neo Splash Matic with Suction Bomb and Triple Ink Strike, a Custom Jet Squelcher with Toxic Mist and Ink Storm, the Dry Slosher Nouveau with Fizzy Bomb and Tacticore, and the Neo Splusher Matic with Squid Beacon and Chlorwell 5.1. There were also 25 new gear pieces from the catalog, and about 50 more gear pieces returned from past games, and a brand new feature called Pools, or as I prefer to call them, Lobby Codes. And about these codes? I gotta be honest, these things are the stupidest things Nintendo ever, actually they're pretty useful. I do enjoy how we now have lobby codes, but I feel like I was initially disappointed how they weren't like the tournament codes in Mario Kart 8 Plus that we wished. I'm probably not the only person to say that everyone has gotten their expectations way too high in the gaming world in recent years. However, these lobby codes are pretty convenient for those who just want to dive into a match very quickly. Now, Nintendo didn't tell us how to use the lobby code, so everybody had to make their own guides. 
go to the envelope and press plus. Just type in something, for example, we'll use anarchy as our lobby code, they're not case sensitive, and you can have it to 32 characters consisting of letters, numbers, and whatnot. And then you'll see notifications from people who've also used the same lobby code as you. You can even drop into your favorite YouTuber's private battle stream, provided you have their lobby code. Just know in case there is a large number of people who use the same code, you won't see everyone's notifications. Oh, I almost forgot. Send notifications, just press and hold Y. It's that easy. We got two new maps added in a Splatoon Freeze. The first one is Manta Maria, a returning stage from Splatoon 2 taking place on a ship with no major changes, and the other one, Yamami Ruins, is an entirely new map set in an excavation site that resembles the Egyptian periods, which was teased back in the 2022. Umami Ruins, while not a completely perfect map, is a whole lot better than Brimewater Springs from last season. One of the major complaints I've seen with Splatoon 3 is the multiplayer map design, specifically the new maps, or Tetramino as nicknamed by fans of the series, added into the game which have been derived by fans for being hallways, for being open, for being cramped, having a few flanking options, and that not many open stages have been added back as of the time making this video. We did have stages like this in the first Splatoon game, specifically Mahi Mahi Resort, Camp Triggerfish, Museum Death Alcino, and Urchin Underpass, the series' signature stage. However, there were experimental and open layouts such as Bluefin Depot, Salt Spray Rig, Piranha Plant, Back Below the Skate Park, Kelp Dome, and Mori Towers, meaning the Tetramino stages weren't frequently common. Splatoon 2 began the trend of more competitive and open maps such as Wahoo World, Humpback Pump Track, Sturgeon Shipyard, Manta Maria, Inqua Art Academy, and Starfish Maygate. But most of the new stages in Splatoon 3, such as Undertow Spillway, Mincemeat Metalworks, and Brine Water Springs, my god, this stage sucks! as well as the Splatoon 3 iterations of Mahi Mahi Resort and Hammerhead Bridge, then it truly began to become the bane of the Splatoon fanbase's existence. Many new maps added during the initial release of Splatoon 3, save for Wahoo, Wallsters, and Shipyard, are all variations on the layout setup of Spawn, Hall, Center, Hall, Spawn. And I believe this is most likely the for possibility of these maps being used for Big Run or Tri or Turf War in the future. Several of these map designs can also be a bit too favored to long-range weapons. Splatlings, Charger and chargers. Many of the new maps tend to have little flanking areas, meaning everybody gets forced into the middle of the map. Mincemeat Metalworks, Undertow Spillway, and a Splatoon 3 iteration of Mahi Mahi Resort have areas where a sniper can easily obliterate anyone and everyone on the opposing team. I'll also provide some good strategies for while playing on these maps. It's best to use a charger, splatling, or stringer on all of these maps. Mincemeat Metalworks is a very open stage, meaning there isn't much cover. The snipers can guard a great on the elevated section of the stage, even though you can swim on it. <laughs> Undertow Spillway has two different hallways connecting to open areas. One splatling in either hall can shut an entire team down. And Mahi Mahi, yeah, this was made with long range weapons in mind, so you can use any long range weapon on this map. I did see several stages have some objects added to hinder ability, but unfortunately, this led to. Why you put a pool in the middle of Wahoo World? Also, Brightwater Springs is just horrible. End of sentence. So, to make a long story short, Founder Heights and Manta Maria were added with minimal changes. Umami Ruins, when it was revealed, was initially derived from being too similar to the Tetramia map style, but fortunately it turned out to be more open and contained at least two flank routes, and was more open than the previous new map added. Hopefully, we'll get more open style maps in the future. Alright, enough of the stage design, let's talk about events. Several new songs were added for Splatfests. We even got not one, not two, but three Squid Sisters songs. The first of those two were revealed on the 23rd of March, with a new remix of City of Color being the first one, and the second one being an entirely new song called Tomorrow's Nostalgia Today. However, going forward, I'll be using the Japanese name brand in hometown instead, because you'd have to be Australian, British, or Japanese to know that the English version of style is clearly based on the song Step Back in Time by Kylie Minogue, unless you don't live in the United Unless you live in the United States, goes by the name of Who. Additionally, we got ourselves a first Flatfest song released on 25 March, being Liquid Sunshine, featuring the artist EMB Jim. Oh, and I'm sure a lot of you figured out already EMB Jim is Bitman of Deep Cut, considering the other languages did that well. But before we can talk about Splatfests, I have something else to talk about. Another big run event happened during the first week of the March, this time at Inkwa Art Academy, and man, this was unforgiving. For those who are new to Splatoon 3, a big run is a phenomenon when a battle stage is invaded by Salmons and Salmon takes place on said battle stages. Gushers are also added and Salmons can spawn out of there. If you thought Big Run was tough on Wahoo World, it was just preparing you for Inkwa Art Academy. Big Run was absolutely insane on this map, and to make things even more insane, we got ourselves a new King Salmon 
Ouroboros. This thing looks like an eel, which means that unlike a Hozuna, it just simply flies around the stage. How bad could this possibly- <laughs> Jesus Christ! That's it! I quit Grisco! The Sabinids can have Inkblot for all I care! I still did big run anyway to make sure Inkopolis and Splatsville didn't fall victim to the Sabinid attacks. I'm so sorry, Small Fry. I just had to do it. There also was another Samurai event added, also known as Extra Work. In Extra Work, you form a team with three other friends. I joined forces with fellow Splatoon YouTubers Skystrainer and Arcanist and Twitch streamer and Epigos, and you tackle a five-way job scenario. The purpose of Extra Work is to build teamwork skills. A little ironic considering that Splatoon doesn't use voice chat unless you download the Nintendo Switch Online app and have the Nintendo Switch Online subscription. I'm gonna say this right now. I approve of Nintendo not using voice chat in our online games, as not only are there many people on the internet who just shout vile insults at and ridicule our players, the directors of Splatoon say that this was the reason for no voice chat, but more importantly, Splatoon uses global matchmaking instead of regional matchmaking, meaning you could be from Spain and end up getting matched with a person from France, Germany, and Italy. I'm just using this as an example because most of those countries don't speak English well enough. Yeah, there's good reason as to why Splatoon doesn't have voice chat. I'm still baffled that the only reward we get is a sticker. So that's the thanks I get for working overtime. Moving away from Grizzco, let's talk about the Splatfests. Just like the previous two seasons, we got two of them, with our first one being a conspiracy fest since it took place around April Fool's Day. The theme was, which one of these did we believe was real? The Loch Ness Monster Scotland, Aliens from Outer Space, or Bigfoot of the Mountains? Team Bigfoot was rarer himself. Bigfoot got only 8.69% in popularity votes, the lowest popularity rate in the history of Splatfests. For comparison, the European exclusive Barbarian vs. Ninja Splatfest had the highest popularity rate at 77%, even though said to lost. I'm not surprised at all why almost all my matches during Tricolor or Turf War during an event were mirror matches. A mirror match in Splatoon is when you're paired up in Splatfest against people from your own team. Any results from a mirror match will not count for Splatfest battle. Also, the Tricolor stage for the Splatfest was Mako Marked. The final results were Team Nessie winning. This was man must also break something to share with everybody. If you go to Kanona, located in the Okanagan Valley of British Columbia, keep an eye out for Ogopogo. Canada's known no oh, Nessie. I guess Nessie is Bessie indeed. <laughs> also, nothing was more awesome than finally getting to see the Squid Scissors once again performing in Coppola's Plaza during the Splat Splatfest. And I'm sure many of you also noticed that their trucks form one stage during the second day, similar to how Deep Cuts floats form into one float on the second day as Splatfests. So keep staying fresh, Callie and Marie. Another Splatfest took place from May 6th to 8th, that being the Power vs. Wisdom vs. Courage Splatfest to commemorate the release of The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom on May 12th. This was surprisingly a lot more fair than the other Splatfests. However, for those who do not play The Legend of Zelda, there's this object in the game called the Triforce, and depending on the installment, it is a major plot point of said installment. The Triforce consists of three different equilateral triangles that form one larger equilateral triangle, and each trial represents different virtues, power, wisdom, and courage, and the three main characters in The Legend of Zelda, Ganon, the titular Zelda, and Link, and that the pieces of the Triforce are combined, and the Triforce gets the ability to grant any wish, making it the series' main conflict. While we're on the topic of the Triforce, we got a very commemorative Tricor Turf War map of Scorch Gorge themed around the Triforce. I've seen a lot of folks on Twitter respond positively to this setup, making it resemble more like King of the Hill, which is what Splatoon's Turf Wars often resemble, at least in Splat Zones. I thought the Tricolor tri Turf War map was impressive, and I really cannot wait to see if this could influence future map design. Even if Team Power won the Splatfest in a sweep, and it was kind of surprised to see Team Power win every category, congratulations to you guys. I'd say this has got to be one of the more balanced Splatfests so far. And that was the Splatoon Free 2023 Fresh Season. I consider that only the chill season. Fresh Season feels more like a breather season, and one geared towards a casual user base. Lobby codes, something everybody wanted when they were mentioned in the ads of developer interview in September 22, were finally implemented, and I find it fun if you're just looking for a specific match to play to pass the time, even if they really only benefit streamers, wink wink, nudge nudge. There's also stuff for the competitive fan base as well. We got two new special weapons, 12 weapons added, and even though Yumami Ruins is still Tetramino, at least we can see Nintendo's listening to feedback from fans. 
A few weeks ago, Famitsu released an interview with the developers on Splatoon 3 with a translation made by Rasiskos. I'll put the link in the description if anyone's curious. Going forward, we're playing months in the Splatoon 3's life, and if Splatoon 3 is going to continue to bring people back, then it has to be in a way that can still be engaging. Maybe a new mode, or some awesome new weapon. Not a reskin like the Zev plus F Chargers, but an entirely new weapon in an existing class, and maybe a new song since we did get some Splatfest songs added this season, but oddly, no multiplayer songs being added. Let's wait and see what the next season brings in store for us, because we're going to have quite the newbie boom, because summer's on the horizon, and every child from school and every teen from college is going to be picking up Splatoon for the first time, and well, it's always going to be a flame war whenever Old Guard vs. New Blood is ever a hot topic. Let's see what happens from here. Thank you for watching this retrospective, and if you enjoy Splatoon content like this, please subscribe and click on the bell to get notified about any future videos, and also if you feel like it, comment down below on what your favorite moment of the fresh season was, and I'll catch you guys in the next video. See you next time!